this here. Okay, I'll show the screen with you guys. Uh, sorry for that delay, uh, the PowerPoint for mixed. So we are delighted to have you all for this uh, uh, three Ramazan nights with the Harvard scholars. Uh, as the Thomas Salai said, we have two other nights, successive nights too. Today, our topic is, and our speaker is Dr. Uh, Shadi Ahmed Nasser. He is an associate professor of uh, Near Eastern Language and Civilization, Harvard University. Uh, the topic of his lecture is the transmission of the Quran its variant readings. Um, I um, let you kind of read the abstract maybe for the same time yourself. It is also on the Telegram channel. So I will go just uh, briefly to introducing him. Uh, you know, Professor Nasser, as, as I said, is Associate Professor of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization at Harvard University. He started uh, uh, first in science, chemistry. He got his uh, Bachelor in Chemistry from American University of Beirut. Then he majored in Arabic language and literature. In 2003, he started a PhD at Harvard University in Arabic Islamic studies under the supervision of Wolfhard Heinrich, completing his PhD in 2011. In 2008, he worked at Yale University as lecturer of Arabic. And from 2009 to 2012, he was a senior lecturer of Arabic and coordinator of the modern Arabic program at Yale University. From 2013-2016, Dr. Nasser was university lecturer in classical Arabic studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, Dr. Nasser's research interest is Moronic studies with particular focus on the history of the transmission of the text, its language, and its reception among the early Muslim community. Also, he's interested in pre-Islamic and early Islamic poetry, Akbar literature, and Hadith transmission, uh, which are among the areas he do research uh, independently in these topics, which are related or related to Quran. Uh, his two books uh, are related, which is related to the topic of today, are uh, the first one is the transmission of the variant readings of the Quran, the problem of Tabatur and the emergence of Shavaz, uh, which is mostly related to the PhD dissertation. And the second one, which has recently come out in 2020, is the second canonization of the Quran, uh, 324, 1936, which is about Ibn Mujahid and the founding of the seven readings which was related to the main topic today. Uh, he has few articles, many articles. Actually, I listed a few of them here. Um, the first two, maybe I read because uh, uh, he himself recommended and is related to the topic um, on hand today. Uh, one is the canonization of the Quran, political decrees or community practices, uh, which is again 2022. And the other one is variations on a team by uh, Muhammad, the literacy supersede orality of the Quran. Uh, so these are then there are other, other articles you can see. But uh, there is one other important thing I think he's involved in it is the interesting and very um, fascinating website called uh, Encyclopedia Variant Readings of Quran, you know, EVQ, the symbol is, or erquran.org. This, uh, as you can see, this uh, instability of the variant readings of Quran is an open access platform designed to study the reception and transmission history of the Quran. The platform functions as critical apparatus of the Quran. It provides data on the variant readings recorded in the Arabic sources. ABQ was developed thanks to the funds and awards through Harvard University. Uh, although maybe th there are, this is the starting to develop in the website. Maybe its goal is uh, at this project has defined to maybe look into some critical edition of the Quran. That has been the goal of the from the time of Nol Dekea of the Western Oranic studies. I really recommend you guys check the video. For those who have known no Farsi, uh, there in, in Enneka's channel, there is a good uh, introduction to it, translating Farsi, how in the movies, but the website itself has movie clips to show you how to use it. Uh, I think uh, uh, without any uh, further ado, I give the podium to Dr. Uh, Shadi Hatmak Nasser and to uh, be listening to his lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you for the generous introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, Ramadan Karim, everyone. And uh, uh, it's 10 a.m. here, my time. So uh, I'm on the other side of the uh, of the continent. Um, so I will, uh, I, uh, from what I understood, um, uh, when, when Hussein contacted me, I wanted to um, uh, give a general introduction to the field, uh, in a sense, uh, to introduce qira'at, uh, what do we mean by qira'at, uh, what do we mean by the transmission of the Qur'an and qira'at, 
so there will be some introductory issues that I will address here uh, and probably uh, a little bit um, some detailed uh, issues as well. Um, now, just for um, uh, in order to gauge my talk a little bit, uh, if I may, can people show hands here, uh, uh, Dr. Farhad? I just want to, to know if everyone here can read uh, basic Arabic, just to know um, uh, when I show some, some slides, uh, if, if people who can read Arabic, not necessarily advanced, just if you can read Al-Fatiha or Al-Duha, etc., I'm just interested to see if uh, if people here uh, can follow me. As I, I understand, um, all the participants, I think, uh, have that uh, yeah. background. You are okay. So just uh, okay, excellent. Just so that uh, I don't say something and then some people are um, uh, are on on another wavelength. Um, so first uh, uh, disclaimer: uh, when and, and during the whole talk, when I talk about. Um, uh, the transmission of qiraat or Muslim consensus, etc. I'm mostly talking about the Sunni position. Okay, so the position of, of Shia Muslims when it comes to the qiraat, it's uh, a little bit different. Uh, so if you have questions on that, I can uh, address them in the Q and A. Uh, but mostly, most of the most of the um, of the talk is about the position of uh, Sunni Islam when it comes to to the uh, to the Quran and qiraat. Um, if uh, if during my talk, if there is anything um, um, questions, I understand is at the end. But if there is something specific that uh, you have to understand, feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind uh, unless you want to keep it until the end. So um, just a question because somebody asked and I wasn't sure to. Uh, are are sure. we recording or are we allowed to record the meeting? I I don't mind. It's it's up sure. to you. It's uh, I I I don't mind at all. So uh, feel free to to record or not record. It's really up to you. I don't mind at all. Actually, we uh, Dr. Masalai always uh, we regularly make these programs available. And there is a Telegram channel of about fifteen hundred people members. So thank you for. I mean, I think is the benefit is many people watch it after the lecture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So. Um, I, I'm going to share my PowerPoint to start uh, from there. So just give me a second. Um, um, so I will keep this to the end. I assume that since most people um, um, uh, you you know you all have the basic or advanced literacy of uh, of of Arabic, and then you are already introduced to Qiraat. I'm not going to play this probably at uh, at the end. So this is just an example of uh, Surah Al-Duha, uh, read in Imala, instead of Al-Duha wa Layli Ida Sajah, it's read Al-Duha wa Layli Ida Sajah. So I will explain this uh, later on. So I will keep it to the um, uh, to the middle of the uh, of the lecture. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, someone said something or? No, it's all yours. No. Okay. Yes, sorry. Um, so let me start with this. So I will. Uh, um, I want to. We, we want to understand what what we mean by the transmission of the Quran and what is the definition of Quran in a sense and what do we mean by masahif or codices. And when you pick a copy of um, uh, one Quran printed in one region or one, on one country today or written. Um, how is it different from other copies uh, published or uh, written in um, in other countries or in other time periods as well? So, so let's take for example this um, uh, the example of this mushaf. Um, it's uh, written in a North African uh, script. Uh, you can see, for example, here that um, uh, the instead of the two dots that we are used to in the qaf, it's written only with one dot, right? For the for the qaf, um, for uh, the fa, the dot is beneath um, uh, the fa. It's not it's not above it. Uh, you see here in, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, the number of verses here is two hundred eighty-six. If you go to another copy, which is also Moroccan. North African, you see, for example, here that the number of verses are 285, okay? You see that um, uh, the, for example, this important word here, Maliki, there's no uh, Aleph Khanjariya, there's no Dagger Aleph. Uh, those who, in the Mashriq especially, they read Maliki Yawm al -Din. In North Africa, they read Maliki al -Din. So 
if you are um, uh, not initiated in the in the discipline, you didn't uh, memorize the Quran, and then you pick a copy, you really won't notice these uh, slight differences. Um, only if you studied um, uh, Quran in an advanced way, and then you basically compare the copies verse by verse, you can uh, tell that there are certain slight differences uh, between the different uh, copies. Similarly, in this in this copy here, you will find that uh, there are no hamzas. For example, minun they don't put the hamza in this specific uh, copy, and uh, it is uh, consistent throughout uh, the text. Um, unlike this is, for example, a comparison. The right uh, side is um, uh, uh, printed based on the reading of nafa or warsh. The left one is the usual hafs one. And then you can see here also the Hamzas are not written on uh, on the wow. The, uh, uh, there are also symbols like Saad here, okay, which you are not used to. You are used to uh, Sil or the Jim or the Meme in the uh, copies of the Quran for the Hafs and the North African uh, Waqf. The way that the pause is a little bit different. This is Saad means Sah. Stop. Um, this is called waqf al-habti in the uh, in the North African tradition. So the point here, I just want to quickly say that if you pick up uh, uh, copies from different regions in the Muslim world that and you compare them, uh, you will find these slight differences in voweling, uh, in verse numbers, um, in also where to stop and where to resume the uh, recitation throughout uh, the whole text. Um, more differences would be um, related to verse numbering uh, is also where specifically to pause, whether the pause has to do with the meaning or with the aesthetics, uh, the rhyming. As you know, there are most of the verses in the Quran, they rhyme. Um, you can see here the uh, regular um, uh, edition of Hafs Sa'na'as and that we are used to. Um, you can the verse numbers here, the verse ending or the rhyming would end with da alif, masjida, gada, rashada, ahada, because they want to uh, pay attention to the rhyming pattern. If you check the um, uh, the warsh slash nafa edition, you would find that they have a verse, uh, they end the verse here, qalil. So they really didn't pay, or rhyming wasn't really a, um, uh, a concern for this kind of uh, verse numbering or verse separation uh, in the chapters. So again, uh, how we separate the verses, where to stop, where to resume, it's also important, especially when it comes to very subtle and nuanced um, uh, meanings of the verses when it comes to the uh, tafsir works. More than that, also if you compare uh, besides verse numberings and vowels, you would also notice that uh, in certain codices that there are also extra uh, prepositions or extra letters. So this is the uh, Surah at tawbah chapter 9, uh, verse 100. And you can see here that the um, most of the codices, including Nafa and Hafs, they would read Jannat and Tajri Tahtaha Al-Anhar. But if you pick up a Mus'haf uh, printed according to the Meccan reading, that you will find here a Min preposition uh, before Tahtaha. And uh, both, again, both are considered in the Muslim uh, tradition to be um, uh, to be canonical to be accepted and we will talk about that later on so these additions um, or omissions the prepositions they are either um, conjunction particles like a wow a fa a huwa uh, they are enumerated you can go to any muslim source uh, concerned with the um, with these textual variants you will find them um, you have here waqalu itqalu without awa Awsa uh, wassa without the alif, sari'u uh, wa sari'u. Again, both are considered to be accepted. Um, and uh, if you haven't checked uh, these masahif printed in other uh, in other countries uh, or older codices, you will not notice them. Again, you have to really compare them uh, side by side, and they really don't affect uh, uh, the meaning much. We will talk about that whether it's important that meanings is is, ch is changed or not. But more or less, there are very slight um, additions and omissions to uh, to the text. Uh, they resulted because of certain historical uh, processes that I will address very quickly. Similarly, there's a table. I have a table in my book that I collected. There are 
uh, derived from uh, classical works by uh, by Dani, by Al Mahdawi, and they are very well documented. You can also see them on the website um, that I have. I can quickly, if we have time, I can show them uh, later on. So, um, so if you again um, buying, you can buy a generic mushaf uh, that usually doesn't really. Uh, uh, have um, any information on the front page or if you want on the page afterwards but if you have a very um, an, an official mushaf uh, that was checked by a committee of that specific country you can see that most countries that have really councils or, or councils of, of muslim scholars who have really committees to to check and double check qurans that countries they do have their own uh, masahif they have their own masahif because they are they are based on a certain transmission or a certain reading out of those seven or ten readings that I will dis discuss very shortly. So, for example, in Libya, you have Mus'haf al-Jamahiriya, which is printed and voweled according to the reading of Qalun, let's say, uh, which is a Nafi' reading, Medina reading. And uh, you have also Warsh, uh, you have, for example, this copy here, this copy and this copy, they are both Warsh but they are also from different transmissions. So you don't only have Warsh, but you also have different ways of reading Warsh uh, in North Africa. So in North Africa, they read Azraq, for example, and the Mashriq, they read Al-Asbahani. I will also address that. But when you are picking a Mus'haf, and if you closely read at the end or at the beginning, you will find, um, if you want these cues, uh, how is this Mus'haf or how is this specific edition of the Quran is printed, and it should tell you, it's, if it's not a generic mushaf, it should tell you that this is voweled and printed according to the transmission of this or that person. Uh, here, this mushaf is Abu Amr uh, from, uh, from Basra, and it's Riwayat al-Duri. It's a specific transmission also from Abu Amr. And this is a mushaf from Brunei, uh, uh, according to Hafs an Asim, which I think most uh, of the Muslim world now, except of North Africa, that they are uh, used to. So what are these different transmissions and why do we have them? And um, uh, why, uh, when you are printing a mushaf, how different these uh, different vowelings and um, verse numbers, etc., from one uh, another? So um, I will quickly go over this chart. This is a chart that uh, I have in my second book and I discuss in the two articles that, um, um, that have been mentioned before. Um, there are certain junctures in time over the past 1400 years uh, of the transmission of the Quranic text that, um, that we consider to be crucial or vital in the transmission of the text. The text and how it is uh, recited. Uh, of course, there are transition stages in between um, each stage. So they are not really clear cut first stage, second canonization, third, there are in between, but more or less, they are big events that happened um, uh, in the history of the transmission of the Quran. So the prophet dies in the year 11 or 632. Uh, as you all know, there, there's huge disagreement among uh, Muslims, all factions, uh, whether a prototype or a certain collection of the Quran was made during his time or not. Um, the general consensus of Muslims, again, Sunni Muslims in a sense, and probably also some Shia Muslims is that uh, there was no really a book collected during the Prophet's time. Probably there was a kind of prototype, whether these uh, verses were arranged in the same time, in the same way that they are arranged today, that's unknown, it's still open uh, question. Uh, but the general consensus of Muslim scholars is that there was no codex mushaf collected during the Prophet's time, despite the fact that there are so many narrations in this in the uh, hadith works and in the akhbar that there were some kind of um, uh, sheets or uh, there was kind of writing during his time. We can address this later. But for the sake of the, the argument from the Muslim sources, at least, is that there was no collection during his time. So the first collection happened during the um, third Caliph Osman, okay? So uh, how long it took, five years, six years, 10 years, we don't know. It's a very long process if you are collecting the Quran according to the narratives that you all know. I don't have to go over it uh, in detail, um, but um, the Quran was partially or fully memorized by many companions. It was written down on 
sheets or or uh, 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 slabs of stone, camel shoulders, etc. You all know the uh, the accounts. It was collected uh, during Uthman's time, and this is what was um, uh, known as the Mus'haf al-Uthmani. So when we talk about the Rasm, which is the consonantal um, uh, outline, uh, this is the first collection of the Quran based on Abu Bakr's collection that happened uh, 20 years uh, earlier. So first canonization is the first step, which all the different verses were collected in one place according to the order that we know today. Now, were there other collections besides Uthman's collection? Uh, collection? Again, open question, but mm, as again, as you all know, that there are many narrations in uh, Muslim sources that talk about other codices. So Ibn Mas'ud's uh, codex, uh, uh, Ali bin Abi Talib's codex, uh, Hafsa's sheets, if they were in, this, in the same order or not, probably they were the same. Uh, Zubair's editions. So you have, again, Kitab al-Masahif by Sajistani. Uh, you can check it. There are different codices with different uh, verse numbers, uh, different textual also variants um, that you can find recorded in Muslim sources. So from, from this time on, when we talk about the Quran or the Rasm, we talk about Uthman's collection. Okay. So gradually, non-Uthmanic versions or editions of the Quran started to die slowly, except for Ibn Mas'ud and probably Ubay. Ibn Mas'ud's uh, reading or codex, there were still many companions and successors, they were still reciting it even in public. So you can read in the sources that in Kufa and Iraq, even up until the second century, 150s, 60s, 70s, and probably even the 200s, that were still people reciting in mosques, according to Ibn Mas'ud's recitation, which is slightly different from the Osmanic uh, recension that we are familiar with. Now, what happened, of course, during this time that, um, let me show you. So this is a, probably this is, of course, not Osman's collection. It's uh, um, a, a replica, uh, but you can imagine that it was huge. So it's, it's a huge effort to collect all these, especially when paper, as we know it uh, today, or even in the Abbasid period, it was not uh, as developed. So uh, this is a huge effort, um, and probably it was really a huge um, uh, replica similar to um, uh, to this. Um, I let me show you. So this is uh, a very actually nice. This is a late fragment. Um, you can see that early Arabic script. Uh, it did not have the vowels and dots that we are um, uh, used to today. They were developed later. Probably there were some uh, early ways of dotting, putting consonantal dots, even in early Arabic script. Uh, some inscriptions, they do have uh, dots. They are not regular. Uh, so there were some kind of dotting, what we call consonantal dotting on, on the lines, but vowels were not developed. And you can see here there are red um, uh, dots that they uh, use for Tanween or for Fatha and Dhamma. Uh, this system was before uh, the um, uh, the vowels that we are used to, the fatha, dhamma, kasra, tanween, ila akhiri. So if you have, uh, again, something like this, it doesn't matter how much Arabic uh, really you know. Uh, if you don't have the text memorized, you can't read uh, the text. So you really need to have the text memorized or know the text uh, before trying to decipher it. Um, so uh, the text of the Quran or Arabic script in general, it really went uh, many, it, it underwent many uh, stages of development to reach this stage that we are familiar with, where you can read and you would barely make a mistake if you, um, uh, if you studied Arabic for, for a few years, at least. So we'll go back to, um, to the stage here. So the text of the of the Quran, the consonantal outline, which we call rasm. So when I say rasm, it means the consonantal outline of the Arabic without dots and without uh, vowels. Um, you can see here that between Uthman and Ibn Mujahid, um, almost three hundred years. Uh, if you go, if you read more into the uh, into the sources, you will notice that um, many Muslim authorities they were reading the Quran. Um, there were several readings spreading across different uh, regions in the Muslim world. Uh, yes, there were readings more popular than other readings, uh, especially in, for example, in, uh, in, in Basra, 
two maybe or three eponymous. When I say eponymous reading, it means a reading developed by one system. Uh, let's say Abu Amr, for example, or Hassan al-Basri or uh, Yaqub. Uh, so they are they are professional Quran reciters that um, uh, professors of, of Qira'at, let's say, and they developed a whole system uh, from beginning to end. So it's not just a transmission of one verse or uh, one, one specific variant. Uh, so there are so many in the sources, there are many system readings or eponymous readings that are documented in the sources. So, for example, you can see um, uh, this work by Al-Hudali. It's called Kitab Al-Kamil fi Al-Qira'at al khamsin There are 50. So now we talk about the seven or the 10 readings. There were more than uh, 10 readings. So there were at least 50, according to um, uh, to Mecca Al-Qaisi here, he says, for example, here that people are narrating uh, nar uh, transmissions of the Quran about the seven readers, uh, but people mentioned more than even 70 uh, readers who are even more trustworthy and uh, more sc scrupulous than those seven readers that uh, people talk about. So there were at least 50 to 70 documented um, uh, eponymous readings or system readings um that muslim sources mention so you can you can of course um, see that this is a problem uh, when it comes to creating a unified system um and this is where ibn mujahid came and he wrote his book on the seven readings which we still adopt until today and he collected these seven readings from a plethora of different system readings that muslims were using back then um so the, the he's there are several criteria that i will address later on based on what he chose this readings but we can assume that though according to him at least they were the most popular readings in these five cities uh five major cities of the muslim world so basra kufa syria mecca and medina he chose seven readers from these five big cities and he didn't really uh, directly say that other readings are shawav the term shawav non-canonical it took a little bit of time to uh, again to be standardized uh, but he chose those seven readings to be the representative uh, readings common to muslims in all these different um, uh, in these five cities now, what Ibn Mujahid did, of course, was a great service to uh, to the system. He tried to unify things. Um, and this is where I studied the um, uh, the book, his book, the Sab'a fil Qira'at, and tried to understand how did he uh, collect these readings. So you can see that it's a very complicated process. It's um, very similar to how someone is collecting uh, hadith in that sense. Uh, so you see Ibn Mujahid here at the bottom. He has different informants. And he goes to each one of them, and then he asks about uh, the reading of Nafa, right? So sometimes he has a full audition. He would recite the whole Quran with, with some of his teachers. Sometimes it's partial. Uh, you can see here that between Nafa and Ibn Mujahid, you have the name of Warsh and you have the name of Qalun. Those two people now, uh, they became the, uh, if you want, the representative um, transmissions from the reading of Nafa. And the question that I ask in the book is what happened to all these other readers, right? And more or less, most of these other readers who also transmitted from Nafa, they fell mostly into the realm of non-canonical. So the Shawav. Basically, Warsh and Qalun, they survived and they became the mostly used recitations in the Muslim world until today. And uh, they are the only, if you want, legitimate uh, representatives of Nafa. The same is true for uh, other readers. So you see Abu Amr ibn al-Ala, the Basran reader. He has so many uh, students transmitting from him. And this is Ibn Mujahid. He's collecting from all these different informants the reading of Abu Amr. Uh, there are disagreements, agreements among them. But again, what survived is basically this guy only, right? Uh, Al Yazidi, who is the main transmitter from Abu Amr, and uh, then um, the you have Susi here and the Duri, they are the representative two transmitters that they are they re legitimately represent Abu Amr's reading. Now there are different reasons why these other transmitters fell from the chains of transmission. Um, 
we can, if, if we have time, I can address that uh, later. But what you have to understand is that the early period of collecting these seven or 10 readings, uh, it wasn't straightforward. So there were so many people transmitting from uh, the autonomous readers and slowly all these other single chains of transmission, they died out in favor of the more popular or more dominant readings um, in a specific region. Now, not all readers were widespread and had so many students or transmissions like Abu Amr and Asim and Nafa. For example, you have this transmission, it's uh, by, by Ibn Amr, the Syrian, it's more or less very poorly document, documented. Uh, you really have only two or three people transmitting uh, from Ibn Amr. And even Ibn Mujahid, he only had three, at, at best three informants to tell him of the reading of an Amr. So you can see the this transmission is completely, is very different from a transmission like Abu Amr or, uh, or Nafa of uh, Medina. So what happened is we get to the, uh, sorry to go back and forward with my slides, but this is the second stage where Ibn, where Ibn Mujahid, he collected these seven. However, those seven systems, they had so many transmitters and most of the time, these transmitters, yes, they agree in a huge percentage on the um, on the system reading or the eponymous reading of Abu Amr or Nafi, but there are still differences among them. And this is where the third stage uh, comes with Adani and uh, Ashaqibi. So, in order to again uh, system systematize the uh, seven readers, uh, Adani came and put a manual called at Taysir. Uh, so it's a student manual to make uh, memorizing the variants from the seven readers or the seven systems easier for, for students and scholars as well. The, the discipline is very complicated, even for scholars. Uh, so he wrote a Taysir and uh, he chose um, two readers. Of course, this, the his his teachers, Ibn Ghalb, his, his teachers from Egypt and uh, uh, Mahdawi before, they were also slowly going into this kind of two transmitters per per, um, uh, per reader. But Adani's work was very forceful in a sense and very influential that people started memorizing it. And we have to understand that there are many uh, books in, in, in Islamic culture that they become popular because they are memorized in a madrasa system. So Adani's book was very popular and people started memorizing it that it really um, uh, took the uh, spotlight from other works uh, written before him. The work was very popular. It popularized two transmitters per uh, reader. And Ashata becomes 100 years after and he put Adani's work at Taysir into a didactic poem. Uh, those who who are familiar with didactic poems like Al-Alfiya, for example, in grammar, or even Al-Fiyat Al-Irati in hadith, you know that didactic poems are very important in the Islamic tradition. So Al-Shati became, and he versified the work of Adani into a poem, into 1,000 plus uh, lines. And this is thanks to Al-Shati, which is still memorized until today, if you are memorizing the Quran according to the seven readers, that he popularized the system of two transmitters per reader. And we get basically the two Rawi canon from this stage. Yes, there were, of course, um, uh, some attempts before, but when they are put into didactic poems and they are memorized in a madrasa system uh, throughout the whole Muslim world from the east, uh, from west to east, um, you, you slightly start getting rid of the single chains of transmission and you focus mostly on two rawis, on two transmitters per one reader. Now, of course, the system, similar to Ibn Mujahid, there were many Muslim scholars who didn't like that, right? So there were many Muslim scholars who opposed Ibn Mujahid's system. Why did you only choose seven systems? Why did you uh, create a shubha or a doubt uh, among Muslims that the seven reader, seven readings uh, probably equal the seven ahruf um, there are other readers more important than the seven, uh, like Abu Jafar, like Yaqub. Uh, why did you, of course, these are questions not addressed to him, but they are addressed in, um, in works of tafsir and qiraat. So people like Abu Hayyan, for example, he lamented the fact that we only have seven readers and we only have two transmitters from 
uh, each uh, uh, reader. So, and he specifically say, I don't have the text here in front of me, but it's a famous quote by him. He says that we reached a stage where people only think that a shatibiya or what is an shatibiya is Quran. So people started to equate what is Quran with the content of a Dani and the shatibi. Um, but there are many other transmitters who are as good or as scrupulous and probably even better than uh, Warsh and Qaloon and Hafs and Shu'ba, etc. So this is where uh, the important fourth stage here by Ibn al-Jazari comes, where he added uh, three uh, readings to the seven. Now, of course, those readings, Yaqub, Abu Jafar and Khalaf, they were uh, they were they were available even during the time of Ibn Mujahid and even before. And there are many books on Qira'ah that uh, document the reading of Abu Jafar and Yaqub and, and Khalaf. However, they were not made into a system in the same way that Ibn al-Jazari made them. So what Ibn al-Jazari did, let me go to his slide. Again, sorry to go back and forth. Um, so he wrote uh, his um, book, An-Nashr fil Qira'at al-Ashr, which is considered basically the comprehensive um, uh, documentation of 10 readings transmitted from different chains of transmission of those 10 readers. The seven of ash plus the three that he added, Abu Jafar, Yaqub, and, and Khalaf. Now, what he did is that he first... He, in order to popularize the three additional systems, he wrote, he, he completed the poem of a shatibi uh, and also versified the systems of Yaqub, Abu Jafar, and Khalaf, and made them also into a didactic poem. So this is one major reason why the three additional readings became so popular, because now they became easier to memorize by students and scholars as well. So uh, after this, the, um, uh, he wrote An-Nashr fil Qira'at al-Ashr, which became, if you want, the comprehensive um, uh, database or a compendium of Qira'at transmitted by different transmitters according to the books of Qira'at. Okay? So now if you want to talk about what is canonical and what is not and what is considered to be uh, a standard reading accepted by, by Muslim scholar, it's basically a nashr fil qira'at al-ashr. It should contain what Muslim, most Muslim scholars would consider to be uh, legitimate. Even though a nashr fil qira'at al-ashr, this is what's called qira'at al-ashr al-kubra, the major 10 readings, there are many people who don't recite according to the content of a nashr. So they, they recite according to the content of the seven, a shatibiya, plus the three additional readings, which are called um, the minor 10 readings, so al-ashr as suhr so if you today, if you are hearing an audio recording by uh, by a qari, most of the time, uh, mostly it will be according to Ash-Shatibiya. And there are very, very few uh, Qurra, especially pro probably in the past 30 or 40 years, there are, there are more people who are memorizing the extra three readings, but according to the um, to the minor, uh, to the didactic poem of Ash-Shatibiya and not to An-Nashr. So the people who, who master An-Nashr fil Qara'at al-Ashr in the Muslim world, they are very, very, very few. They are probably top of the line uh, who are able to memorize the content and the transmissions of, uh, of An-Nashr. And many of these Qira'at in the An-Nashr specifically, even though they are considered to be legitimate transmissions, they are not used in recitation. Um, I don't have a percentage, but there are few readings in there that you don't really hear in uh, in, in, in recitations unless someone is doing a, uh, a professional audition, student and master, but it's not really a public uh, audition of the uh, of the Quran. So we go back to the to the chart. Uh, so this is here, if you want the the final stage of um, of what is considered to be accepted in the Qira'at literature and what is not. So if you are reading the Quran and you want to know what are the variant readings that are accepted, it's basically Ibn al-Jazari's system of the 10 readings. They are more or less accepted, even though there are Muslim scholars who don't consider the 10 readings to be accepted. They only consider the seven and they really don't consider the additional three to be. But let's say that there is a group or a majority with a small a of Muslim scholars who consider the 10 readings to be mutawatira, I will address this uh, later, but accepted 
and valid and you can use them in prayers. After that, so we have the 1923 or 24 uh, edition by Al Azhar. Now this is a little bit different from the other stages. And the reason why I put it here as a, as a peculiar stage is this is when printing became important in the Muslim world. And when Al Azhar, the first printed edition and the mass distribution of, uh, of the Mus'haf, it was based on the reading of Hafsa al-Asim. So the reason why in the Mashriq, at least on the majority of the Muslim world, except Morocco and some African countries uh, that they read in Hafs is because during the Ottoman period, Hafs was popularized. Before the Ottoman period, uh, people were not reading officially according to Hafs. Uh, they were reading Abu Amr or Warsh or Qaloon and the, the Ottomans popularized Hafs uh, again for, re for reasons we can um, uh, speculate about. But in the past 400 years in, in, from Egypt uh, eastward, uh, Hafs became more popular. And Al Azhar, of course, uh, Egypt, they printed the 23, 24 edition of the Quran based on Hafs, which is the familiar, um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, fi the two final two pages of the Mus'haf, Mus'haf al Masaha or Mus'haf al Amiri that was printed in Egypt in 1924. And uh, it basically says here um, that we wrote, the, this Mus'haf was written according to the transmission of Hafs um, uh, from his master, uh, Asim bin Abi Najud. And the, the reason why this is important, or again, a vital point is that the perception of most Muslims uh, today with the exception of some African countries and North Africa, is that they are mostly um, familiar with the Quran based on the edition of Hafs. And uh, those of you who who talk who who know the discipline a little bit, and if there are some among you who who uh, who memorize some of this Torah or studied them, you know that if you go from one country to another country, and then you recite something uh, different from what the other country is reciting, some people, even though they memorize the Quran, they are considered to be hafad. Um, they will raise an eyebrows, like, what, what are you saying? This is this is not the reading that I'm accustomed to, because they are reading according to Nafi' or Abu Amr, and you come and read according to Hafs, or vice versa. If you are memorized, if you memorize Hafs, and then someone is reciting to you in uh, in Warsh or in Abu Amr uh, or Qaloon, they will also raise an eyebrow. It, it's even worse if they are reciting something according to Hamza or al Kisai or Khalaf, uh, which no um, Muslim country adopted in the past 1400 years. They are considered to be uh, uh, valid readings, but really there was no official um, adoption for, for these three readings. So the printing of, uh, of Al-Azhar in 1923 of Hafs is very important. What is also important is the audio recording. The first audio, full, complete audio recording of the Quran, it was in 1963 or 64 uh, by Al-Husari. Uh, for those of you who know, also it was recorded according to Hafs uh, Asim, and it popularized this reading throughout the whole Muslim world. Um, and uh, for those of you who are interested, there is a book um, by Labib Saeed, it's called Al Jam Al Sauti Lil Quran. He talks about the steps when they were trying to record the Quran, and there was really resistance from Al Azhar. He documents that in letters and correspondences with Al Azhar. There was a fierce resistance from Al Azhar to record the Quran um, in a recitation different than Hafs Al Asim because they didn't want to create this kind of shubha or doubt, and they want to unify uh, Muslims based on one uh, recitation. To further stress uh, or emphasize this point. Um, this is a, a clip I, I uh, recently uh, uh, translated. Um, and let me, I can't play, can I play from here? Okay. <laughs> Um, 
قراءة أهل البلد الآن كلهم على قراءة حفص فلا يجوز أن يقرأ بقراءة غيرها ويخالف ما عليه أهل البلد ويشوش على الناس فمثل هذا إذا لم ينتهي يفصل من الإمامة أما إذا صلى لنفسه هو لا مانع أنه يقرأ القراءات السبع إذا صلى لنفسه ما في مانع لكن يا أم الناس لا شوش عليهم نعم Okay, so this is uh, Al Fawzan. He's uh, one of the top uh, authorities in uh, Saudi Arabia, and they issued a fatwa. You can also check that online. There are several um, uh, fatwas slash legal ob- legal opinions for some of the some leaders in congregational prayers. They are trying to um, introduce readings besides hafs in for for Muslims and. From a legal perspective, um, you have you have two two things here in in play. One, do we confuse people? So you are reciting something that people are not uh, familiar with, and the lay Muslim is not familiar really with these other uh, readings. So why are you doing that? If it's really addressed to people who are familiar with the discipline, that's fine. Um, but there's this element of confusion uh, that. Of course, this is not a new fact. This is not a new opinion. You can also trace this opinion back in legal uh, works, uh, 400, 500 years ago. That there's always a um, an advice given to the imam that if you are trying to recite the Quran, try to recite it according to the reading of the people of that region. Uh, otherwise, you will confuse them or you will um, uh, create some kind of shubha. Uh, that is not uh, recommended. Uh, so again, there's an element of maslaha here uh, that lawyers are uh, mostly interested in. So Al-Fawzan here is not talking from a, from a theological perspective. He's completely talking from a, a social slash legal perspective and the position is um, uh, is well understood. The, so I just wanted to, to give you a, um, um, in a sense, uh, a very brief um, uh, introduction to these different stages and emphasize why the last stage, it's not about qira'at, it's just basically about hafs and the, and the perception that we have today in the majority of the Muslim world about the reading of hafs when people are reading or hearing something that is not hafs, which is sometimes very different uh, from uh, other readings that, um, uh, you know, they will be confused or they will think, what is this recitation? I haven't heard it before. Uh, such as, uh, for example, if for those of you who never heard uh, uh, Imala before. Okay. So, uh, so this is a a, um, a common. Uh, asal or principle and recitation for some of the readers that they do this kind of imala. There are, of course, complicated rules for imala. You can't just every single alif make it an A. Uh, there are also different grades of imala. Some of them say wadduhe, some of them wadduha. It's in between A and E. So there are rules for that. Um, but if you never heard that before and then you hear it for the first time, which happened to many people, sometimes I play this in class and uh, some students, this, this is the first time they ever uh, heard a recitation with uh, with email. Um They will be um, confused or they really uh, think that uh, sometimes this is a prank because they think, oh, this is a kind of a vulgar uh, dialect. It's a dialect that is used in some Arab uh, countries today. And they think that this is a kind of dialect that people are sometimes making fun of the recitation. Uh, but it is not. Um, so these are more or less the five different stages of uh, the transmission of qira'at in, in general. There are, again, the, there are big junctures that I consider to be big, big junctures in the, in the history of the transmission. Um, and they really defining moments in the sense of what people, when, I, when, when we think about that, we we'll always go back to time. So w- when I read the Quran today, I'm reading it according to this kind of edition or this kind of transmission. What did the people in the year uh, 800 read? What did the people in the year 1200 read? What did the companions of the Prophet uh, uh, read? Were they reading the same exact text of the Quran that we are reading today? And uh, the, the 
the simple answer is is no. It doesn't mean that they were reading completely different things. More or less, they are the same text. The differences are very minor and subtle, but sometimes there are differences in the vowels and in the um, in the way that words are pronounced that that make uh, a difference, especially when it comes to prayer. The defining thing, the def the, mo the most defining, uh, uh, if you want, feature of what is accepted and what is not is not meaning. It doesn't matter for lawyers, for legal scholars, not for the exegetes. What matters for lawyers is that if your prayer is valid or not. And what they are mostly concerned is when you are praying, can you use this specific recitation in your prayer or not? So, hal salat tujze aw la tujze. If I recite according to Ibn Mas'ud, can I recite in the recite in the recitation of Ibn Mas'ud, even if it doesn't change the meaning? And the answer is no, according to lawyers. Now, of course, you can, if you are a, um, a faqih, you want to argue against that, that's fine. Uh, but the most important thing of why Muslim scholars limited these recitations is to try to unify uh, Muslims and unify the way that um, uh, reading the Quran is um, uh, recited and transmitted and to try to eliminate as many differences uh, as possible. Sometimes it backfired, probably more or less. Uh, uh, it was This kind of systematization throughout history, it was one of the reasons why the Quran is more or less a stable text, uh, thanks to basically these enforced canonizations. Now, lastly, uh, I'm not going to go over the collections. You all know that you can look them online. I uh, uh, I thought that most of you, since most of you are familiar with this, so I don't have to go over the collections. And you, since some of you also read the articles, uh, oh, but it's important also to recognize that um, when when you try to systematize a text, uh, there are uh, politics is always involved with these. Uh, with these decisions. So you don't have a text uh, that is not enforced by a political slash religious authority. So always, we have to always think about the role of politics uh, that is played. Um, for example, you there are several um, uh, uh, hadiths to this effect. You can find this in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. Um, when someone was trying to uh, recite uh, Abu Darda here, he's saying, like, is there someone among you who can read? He said, yes. And then they pointed at me and he said, okay, read. And then he read, okay. And this is an addition. This is not in the Mus'haf. And then it's like, did you hear it from, uh, from your companion? And he said, yes. And I heard it from the mouth of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And those, ya'buna alayna, ha'ula ya'buna alayna. And Ha'ula is a reference to a group of people, probably uh, uh, commissioned, you know, by 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 the uh, religious slash political state. Is that to go and try to standardize things? People who are not reading according to the uh, official uh, mushaf or the official reading that is standardized in a city, uh, they are trying to basically watch people and what who is reciting what. Similar to what Al-Fawzan was uh, was saying in his in his fatwa is that okay we need to standardize things we don't need people to read different from how the majority of Muslims are uh, reading. You have, for example, a uh, an account from uh, biographical dictionary Maratib al uh, by al Lughawi, and he's talking about the grandfather of Al Asma'i. Al Asma'i is a great uh, philologist and uh, poetry collector. And uh, he also uh, has a transmission of the Quran from Nafa. So he was also a Quran reciter. He's not known as a Quran reciter, but he uh, he dabbled with some qiraat. His grandfather, he his job was كان يتولى محو المصاحف المخالفة لمصحف عثمان. So his job was to basically check all the different codices in Basra to see if there are codices different um, from the Mus'haf of Uthman, from the official Uthmanic Rasm. So when you are, the, one of the reasons why most Quranic manuscripts are more or less, they are really the same and you really don't find, um, unless there are very, very few non-canonical masahif that you can find in libraries now, today, fragments, but more or less, there was a systematic process over the past 1400 years to systematize all the masahif and the codices according to basically the Osmanic uh, rasm. And 
uh, lastly, the last point I want to say before I stop, um, this is for those of you who don't know Ashatabiya, it's a very complicated uh, uh, didactic poem. Uh, we say a poem, it's not really poetic at all. It's just didactic poem and it's very cryptic. You really need uh, someone to teach you how to understand it. Uh, it's not really a straightforward uh, poem. Um, there's a legend for it. There are many commentaries uh, on it. People memorize it. Those who specialize in the seven readings, they memorize it. And uh, it's uh, when you memorize it and understand it, 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 it makes it easier for you to know the differences between the different uh, between the different qiraat. Uh, generally speaking, uh, how what is what are the criteria for a valid Quranic transmission? Okay, so why did these seven or ten readings became the um, uh, legitimate rep representative of qiraat. The first important uh, criteria is that they have to agree with the rasm. The five codices, these different prepositions that I referred to at the beginning, the, the min and hua and li, they are still considered part of the rasm because there are five copies acknowledged by Muslim scholars to be five copies. They're all equal. Any uh, mushaf that deviate in the rasm and the consonantal outline from that, even though it, it, even if the meaning is the same, even if the meaning is better than the original than the rasm, the Uthmanic rasm, it's rejected by Muslim scholars. So it has to agree with the rasm. It has to adhere with the rules of Arabic grammar. This is a very big umbrella. Anything that agrees with Arabic grammar, even even in one way or another. Uh, it is a valid Quranic reading. It must have a sound transmission isnad. That's a later um, um, addition uh, influenced by hadith transmission that you need um, a sound transmission from the prophet to the canonical reader even later on. Uh, early Qurra, they really didn't um, consider sound transmission to be a criteria, but there was this kind of ijma. Uh, consensus, local consensus in one region uh, that most of the people in this region are reading according to that reading. So this was an element, and if you want three and four, they oscillate according to uh, the scholar and which element they uh, consider to be prior to the other. Um, crucial elements in Quran transmission, um, I can't talk about hadith now, but if people are interested, they can ask me later, is that uh, physical space, time, and an enclosed circle of professionals is very important. The Quran is long, uh, it's complicated, it's unlike hadith where you can transmit only one hadith or two or write it down and then you can transmit it later on. You need the kind of physical space, you need the luqya to meet the person, you need a long time, and you really need a professional and a student to be transmitting from one another. So this is why fabrication uh, in qiraat uh, it's way, way less than the fabrication that you find in hadith because it was more controlled. Uh, most of the differences you find in qiraat, they were due probably to transmission errors, um, uh, mistakes, but more or less fabrication. Like you rarely, rarely find someone said, oh, he created a qiraat or he fabricated it or he lied on the behalf of Nafa or Asim uh, because the circle of this qiraat, they are very, very limited uh, and very controlled. And of course, teaching and disseminating. You could you could have a great uh, Quran reciter who is trustworthy, but he didn't have students and he didn't transmit the qira'a. His qira'a dies. And the best example is Abu Amr al Yazid. He wasn't considered to be his best student. Uh, Abbas ibn al Fadl, for example, he was considered to be his best student. But Abbas became a judge. He wasn't interested in uh, teaching uh, the qira'a of Abu Amr, and then it was delegated to al Yazidi uh, afterwards. So um, this is, uh, I will I will end uh, here. I think, yeah, more or less I'm on time. Um, very quickly, the distribution of readings today in the Muslim world, mostly four readings are used. Uh, probably also not throughout history, but today throughout the Muslim world. You have Hafs, of course, in most of the, if you want, Eastern period from Egypt to uh, Iran, Turkey, Iran, uh, Pakistan, India, etc. Most, most of more, more or less, ninety-nine percent they read according to Hafs. In Libya, they read Qalun, um, An Nafa, which is the historical, if you want, North Africa reading right here, mostly, and Al Andalus, 
historically for the past 1400 years, they, they read Nafa and they oscillated between Warsh and Qalun. Tunisia and Algeria, Morocco, of course, they are Warsh for the past uh, 14 centuries. And uh, in some African countries you have in Sudan, Somalia, they still, until today, they read in Abu Amr and al Uh even though Hafs is slowly replacing it in the past 30, 40 years, uh, but you can still find uh, p communities that they read according to uh, Abu Amr there. Uh, if I have time, if someone wants to ask about Qira of Tawatur, I can uh, respond to that uh, later. And very quickly, just the um, uh, position of Muslim scholars concerning Qira'at, it, uh, it, we have to also acknowledge that it changes with time. Uh, so people like a Tabari, for example, he's notorious and he was known for rejecting many of the Qira'at that later Muslim scholars considered to be mutawatira or correct, divinely transmit, divinely acknowledged, um, uh, uh, if you want, uh, revealed by God uh, to the Prophet. Uh, and considered to be uh, accepted by the Muslim community. So people like Tabari, uh, Zamakhshari, several readings from, from uh, opinions also by Ibn Atiyah, um, they did not have this kind of mindset that later scholars of Qira'at, that every single reading and every single individual reading, uh, they are correct. So people like Tabari, they were performing textual criticism. And he says, this is one example out of, of tens of other examples in his tafsir, and he would simply say, well, this Qira'a, Qarna versus Qirna, we choose Qirna fi buyutikunna, it's awla andana bisawab, this is more correct. And you find the editor here uh, always, always intervening and saying, no, both readings are correct. There's no such thing as one reading that is more correct than the other. You see how the difference between if you want later uh, Muslim scholars and early scholars, they didn't have this kind of, uh, if you want, theological and legal uh, baggage to consider that every single reading has to be correct. So the position of early scholars, um, it depends again, according to scholar, but when you are checking all these different stages, stages of the Quran being standardized and the Quran being considered to be canonical or non-canonical, uh, we have to um, stop generalizing, generalizing and say, well, Muslims say that. It depends when Muslims were saying that. Uh, were they saying that in the first century, the second century, after Ibn Mujahid, before Ibn Mujahid, um, and not to basically apply the label of um, uh, all Muslims, uh, including Sunni Muslims or Shia Muslims or whatever, that they think uh, that this qira'a is correct. You have people like Tabari and Zamakhshari, they are great commentators, and according to them, uh, many of those readings that we, we consider today are canonical, they were not uh, to them, and they had their own reasons, of course. Um, so this is, I think, what I wanted to uh, say today. There are other things, if people are interested, they can ask me in the Q&A. Um, and if we have time, I can also uh, show them the website that you, you also introduced. If you are interested in the Qira'at, canonical and non-canonical, you can go to the EVQ also. Uh, website and you can uh, find many information uh, there as well um, so I will stop here thank you for uh, uh, listening and uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions or explain further points that they were uh, a little bit uh, vague or not expressed that well um, thank you very much Dr. Nasser really enjoyed it, it was very informative very attractive very interesting uh, just uh, more, maybe the more limiting factor is your time. How long, how long you can stay? Because my point is that uh, if you can uh, show the website yourself, it would be the most interesting thing. Because I'm worried if we start the questions, maybe time uh, runs past by evidence. So let me, because you are the teacher, is the best teacher. A few minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, you show to us, and then we can go to questions. Sure. So let me uh, here. You can see it, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So um, so I will basically focus uh, on Al-Fatiha. All of you know Al-Fatiha, of course. Um, you have, uh, of course, all the Quran is recorded here, so you can go to any verse. It's still a work in progress. All the canonical readers, the seven and the ten, are all recorded uh, on the website. I'm still working on the Shawad. 
uh, it's uh, it takes a lot of time because I enter everything manually. Uh, so I have to uh, double check for mistakes and make sure um, uh, the sources are correct. And uh, it's very difficult to, to do everything on your own. Uh, so let's take Al-Fatiha, for example. Let's go to Maliki, okay? Um, and you can see here the readings. Uh, uh, I have labels for them, right? So seven, you can select here the labels, the seven readings. The 10 readings, Sughra, the minor ones, which I talked about, the didactic poems, uh, Shatvi and uh, Durra, and the 10 Kubra, which is the Nashr um, uh, in, in totality. There are other systems, the 14 readings, four extra readings to the 10. They are considered by most Muslims to be Shawad, even though there are still people today, I think three or four uh, really high authorities, they are licensed with the uh, readings of Al-Hassan al-Basri and uh, al Yazidi ibn Muhaysan and Al-Amash. Uh, but let's say the majority of Muslim scholars consider them the extra four to be uh, Shawad. And you have Shawad, Uthmanic, they agree with the Rasm, but they are considered Shawad, non-canonical. And you have non-Uthmanic codices, they, they um, uh, disagree with the consonantal outline. So there are different labels here that uh, I use to distinguish each reading from another. If you go to Maliki or Muddin, you have Maliki and Maliki. Uh, I you saw you, also, sorry, I interrupt. You have the Shi readings too, it seems. Yeah, those. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. So yeah. I have here at the end here. So this is uh, labeled. I, the, the reason I labeled them Shia readings because they are more or less, they are not used in liturgical settings. So they are used yes. in the books of uh, Tafsir um, and some of the narrations on, on Tahrif al Quran. I can talk about that later on. But because the position of Shia scholars, it's a little bit different from the, the mainstream Sunni scholars. I also separated them. So you have here, for example, Malaka. It's a specific Shia reading that you can find in, um, um, in by a narration by Kulaini, I think. So they are also th there. Uh, grammatical readings, uh, these are hypothetical readings. So grammarians would say, well, this reading makes sense, but we didn't hear anyone reciting it this way. Uh, so I gave it a label as grammatical, so do not confuse basically this reading with other readings. So everything is labeled here based on the sources and not according to my own uh, understanding of this. So you can see here like a word like Maliki or Medin, it has over 20 or 21 different uh, variants recited by authorities. So they are not just lay people, they are scholars and they are authorities in the Qira'at, and they were all reciting it, uh, including greetings that deviate from the Rasm, Maliki, Malikan Yawm din Malikan Yawm din You have words like Sirata, for example. Uh, it is read as uh, Sabil, so they change uh, sometimes the Sirat into a, a synonym for the word. Ghayri, um, Stiwa, uh, uh, sometimes the the um, variants are just phonetic instead of a dalin. You don't want a long alif followed by a shadda, so you turn the alif into a hamza. It would be easier. So it's easier to say a dalin than a dalin. Anyways, that has to do with tajweed. Um, you also have a dalun. So if you click on any word on the website, you can. If they are grayed out, if they are not grayed out, Allah, for example, it doesn't have any variant yet. If I encounter a manual later on that has a specific reading for Allah here, I will put it. But if you find a black, um, not grayed word here, it means that I haven't found variants for them. All other grayed out uh, readings, it means that they have variant readings recorded sources. And if there are seven or 10, you can also click on the uh, audio. Uh, and you can hear them. Maliki Yawmiddi. Maliki Yawmiddi. So I only take the excerpt from, uh, I don't want to play the whole uh, verse, just taking the excerpt of the specific word so that people who are interested, they can uh, follow these. Uh, you can click on the filter table view right here, and then it gives you the sources. So if you want to double check, you go to annotations, and you see where I took this information from. Who read Malika, for example, by Abu Huraira? You see it in Mukhtasar Shawad by Ibn Khalaway. Uh, this is from a Shatibiya. Uh, this is by Masahif, edited by Jeffrey with the page number. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the readings here, most of the annotations they are taking from the sources. You can go to the source and um, uh, check the exact uh, uh, page number uh, for that. Lastly, you can also do some kind of filtering. 
for example, let's say here, this is the whole database of the Quran and you are interested in this table, you want to, for example, variant type, let's say addition, right? So you want to see variant types that have to do with additions or omissions. So I, this, these are the variants. I have almost 48 pages of uh, different variants that have additions or omissions, whether a letter or a uh, sentence or a word. If you hover on that, this is the, uh, the Hafs reading, the standard one is قُلْ أَعُوذُ in this variant reading, it's a'udhu without qul. So this is, and qul is omitted from uh, from the source. Um, you can choose, let's say, uh, another variant type, let's say case ending, Arab. okay? I am only interested in readings that show case ending. So ar-Rahman ar-Rahima, for example, instead of ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, right? Um, so there are different types of filters here that uh, uh, people can use to narrow down the data if they are interested only on the seven or the 10 or 14 or specific grammatical uh, types of variants, um, they can also use it here. You can also use the filters in the annotations. Let's say you are only interested in transmission from uh, Asim, for example, you can type here and then you can choose Asim. You can also choose uh, Hafs. Okay, you can choose multiple um, um, uh, multiple names and the filters as well. And it, it will only give you the uh, specific annotations by Asim and Hafs based on that. So here, remember, we chose case endings, Arab. It will give you here what Asim and uh, uh, Hafs, for example, have different case endings from the others. So there are different ways of using the filters. If you are into this uh, uh, discipline, you are more than welcome to use. If you find mistakes or typos, please write to me because I enter everything manually. I, I find mistakes all the time. So please, uh, if you are using this and you find mistakes, uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this tour. Uh, it was very interesting. I mean, a couple of points. I mean, I, I'm familiar with website, but a couple of points was new too. And then it's very great. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, and then just one question. So, you is working the progress, and then, mm, uh, I mean, uh, how, what do you, what is the future you see for it, and how long does it take to be completed, or something like? That? The, so, I think um, um, for the website, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it depends. I mean, the sources are massive, right? So. Yes. Uh, uh, so you have even the more, I mean, you have, we have at least hundred, hundred important sources that we have to, I have to include in the, in the website. Um, it all depends on funding and manpower, right? So, uh, if you give me, if you give me a couple million dollars, I can finish it in, <laughs> in a couple of years. Uh, but you have uh, sources like, especially with the tafsir, um, that you have, to, sometimes there are sections, it's easy, like, you know that after the commentary, this is the qira'ah, you can really just extract the information. But sometimes there are, the editions are wrong. I have to compare one edition to another edition. Um, so I would see like a few years at least of entering data. If there are more people working with me on that and I uh, have more funding, it would take less. But I wouldn't say forever, few years uh, to have really a, a decent uh, database of the non-canonical readings, at least. Um, uh, so I have still many sources. I think I think there are at least ten now, ten to fifteen sources entered. Uh, still need probably eighty plus to uh, to reach a stage where I'm very happy with the uh, with the product. Yeah. Inshallah, and then maybe this kind of uh, lectures uh, get some collaborators because there are people yes. doing IT yeah. and then they're good. I mean, like yeah, who knows? Inshallah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, so there are, there are a few questions. I will go with the order I received them. I maybe somehow, uh, I mean, add something a little briefly to it too. So the, the first one uh, is uh, one of the friends asked, I'm not sure he's here. Uh, uh, are you are you here? Do you ask your question yourself? Because he was in Denver, I think they just, okay, uh, seems he's not. So, I mean, he said he's doing his iftar, so ask me to ask, maybe he's- I think he's, he's here. He's here. You know, Mohamed, has, uh, can, you, can you ask Mohamed yourself a question? Oh, Leah. If not, I will ask. 
Okay, maybe I ask, but then he can uh, put it. So the question is this, uh, he put it like this, what is the, uh, uh, Dr. Shadi's uh, 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 Nasser um, uh, opinion about the possibility of existing an older manuscript of Quran uh, before Osman canonized manuscript, which was used as the source for not only Osman's, but also other manuscript after before, including Sana Musab, as, as uh, Sadiq and Gud, as they say in their article. Uh, maybe I a little bit uh, uh, add to this question, and I'm sorry I, I use the kind of privilege. Uh, so you know the whole question of written and oral maybe come through, uh, which can explain um, the question was about uh, non osmanic mushaf or ras in the question, but also this issue of written and oral, uh, how these garat come to existence. And I know your article is addressing that. Maybe we can use the time addressing that. And then Behnar uh, Sadiri had the model that maybe the really uh, uh, the, there was something dictating these differences uh, in the pre Osmanic Mustafs, you know, like you, you mentioned Abdullah Masood, Oban Kab. Maybe it was as part there, maybe somebody was dictating, you know, the time of Prophet, at least the traditional story says they were Katibs, they were writing it down, and it could be Abdullah Masood wrote it a little bit different, Oban Kab a little bit different. And then uh, these differences that you mentioned, Zayfi Yaman, maybe come from that, and then Osman standardized them. And then how he did it, maybe he bring all those copy put like you know, how we do correcting the old manuscript things. So I, I I know what was kind of, I want you to elaborate on it at all levels. You can, you want. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is uh, most probably there was some kind of uh, prototype before the of action, right? So whether we go, whether we go with the manuscript evidence or whether we just rely on the tradition, right? Um, the reason that even Ibn Mas'ud, at least what the sources tell us, okay, even Ibn Mas'ud's reading or Ubay bin Kaab, or even even if, if you want the, the readings that completely deviate, like some of the Shia readings, for example, uh, they are not really, uh, they don't change the syntax that much, right? So Ibn Mas'ud's reading is mostly changing one word for another. The syntax is more or less the same. So it means that they are they, there is a model that they are copying from. Uh, it's not completely oral in the sense that they memorize it. I mean, we have to also understand when we talk about oral is that people back then, they did not have Shatabiya, right? So they didn't memorize. They were memorizing the Quran based on a different, completely different system on how uh, we started to memorize the Quran later on. Uh, so Ibn Mas'ud's uh, memorization of the Quran was most probably different than the memorization of other companions. But even the information that we have from the non-canonical readings, they are very, very similar. Changing one word for another, adding a preposition here, uh, adding a, 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 a small word, but the syntax more or less is the same. Uh, so yes, this reinforces the idea that there was a prototype, Ibn Mas'ud, Ubay, etc., that they were all either memorizing from or copying from and it's it was not a process free for all everyone was just writing his his own codex uh based on memory and without really consulting other uh, other copies so uh, uh if we find a codex before uh, the Osmanic uh, codex whether fragments uh, or uh, and we have ac uh, accurate carbon dating i don't think it should be a surprise to anyone if we find even fragments that date to uh, 632 or 630, because sources tell us that there were some kind of writing happening, even though it's not a full codex, but at least some kind of uh, fragments, chapters. Uh, so I'm, if we find a manuscript or a fragment, I'm more than uh, uh, happy uh, in, in that regard. And it confirms what we have in the sources, so. Thank you, thank you so much. I, uh... I may come back later to this, but because I want to ask the questions of other people. Uh, you know, people are, uh, uh, this question of uh, whether the Quran was collected in time of the prophet or not is, is a question. As you mentioned, uh, John Burton, which is, is contemporary, I mean, very the same time Glansborough wrote those two books, he wrote his book, and then Ayatollah Khoi, uh, which is not unanimous Shia view too. You know, Ayatollah Marifat has the, uh, this, but al we have the same view. 
as, uh, as Sunni scholars usually have, this is collected time of Osman, but Ayatollah Khoi has the view, it must be, as, as you mentioned in your book, too, uh, must be collected in time of Prophet uh, Muhammad. So people, one people ask, uh, what is your opinion about this? Because you see, maybe a, a little bit expand the question is, Quran emphasized writing, uh, for example, when you contract, you know, even your the trip, write it. The longest verses Quran is about writing, katab and the issue of even how many katabs, we, how many witnesses we have to get. And then we have the, in, in, in the, as you said, tradition, we have katabs and even the conversion of Omar, for example, we hear his uh, uh, sister and brother-in-law have a, 20, a scroll of the 20 verses of uh, uh, Surah Al-Taha. So the writing was there. And I think this, uh, I mean, adding to it, the Arab community, Mecca community was a trading community. There must have form of writing. And even people said the writing when we do this, documents, not religious documents, commercial documents, is more accurate, more elaborate. You have dots more over there, less here. So all of these, uh, I want you, if you can, you know, kind of get, again, get the, just a question, you elaborate on. Um, uh, more on the issue of writing during uh, during the time or whether the Quran was... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so maybe I didn't put yeah. it completely. So we say, despite this uh, ability to write, you know, I know these people, uh, some people say it's people that illiterate, but we know in Medina, they weren't as much illiterate because the Jewish people were there, Zayd ibn Sabit, and many of them were studying over there. Abdullah Masood himself, he so I wrote 70 uh, surahs before even you were a child. So these guys were writing. So the whole question is, that how is it possible it was not collecting time of prophet? Or what do you think? Do you think, it, uh, uh, is it, pro Oh, what's your opinion? Because a simple, just a question was that, what is your opinion about the uh, Ayatollah Khoi and John Burton's opinion that this was really yeah. the main collection in time of Prophet, was collected in time of Prophet Quran? Okay, so so I, I don't necessarily have a, a, a strong opinion concerning whether, I mean, first, we will never know, right? So I could have an yeah. opinion whether the Quran was collected during the time of the Prophet or not, but that's not the issue. The issue is, the 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 narrations of the collection of the Quran. They, there is a lot of politics happening in there, right? And uh, if you are, you know, a lay Muslim, you just want to, um, you don't want to have, uh, uh, let's say, you, you don't want to approach these narrations about the companions, about how they collected the Quran. If you don't want to approach these narrations from a political slash social perspective and you only approach them from a sense of piety uh, then that's a, a, another a whole different perspective because the narrations of the quran they are very political uh, if you look at them from a historical perspective uh, first the caliphs are involved with them omar and abu Bakr they are involved with these narrations there's a huge reason why uh, Shia scholars early and even later on, they were not very happy with this collection, especially with the ex ex exclusion of Ali. Um, and even besides the whole Shia Sunni thing, um, the way that these narratives present the, uh, if you want, the prophetic period, they want to basically say that, I mean, even the description of how the Quran was written on uh, shoulder blades and leather and and scraps of things. It's a very primordial, if you want, picture uh, of of how things were during the prophetic period. That things came and then they put things in order. So there's a lot of politics happening in there. So we shouldn't dismiss the political aspect in these narrations. Trying to really uh, probably give more credit to uh, Abu Bakr and uh, Omar and Uthman in a sense of how they collected the Quran and how they standardized it um, uh, really from nothing in that in that sense. Uh, even though there are many narratives in the, uh, again, in the Sunni sources about how you have scribes for the Prophet, he wrote letters to kings, um, there, uh, uh, there were many narrations of uh, Aisha. She had her own Mus'haf. Uh, they were reading from the Mus'haf. Omar, you also mentioned uh, about him. Uh, so yes, there, there is, uh, there are many question marks, and this is why these question marks are raised by Shia scholars, including Al Khui and and many other also. That uh, we they think that the Quran was collected during the time of the Prophet, and these narrations were were fabricated somehow, or they were really trying to give more credit to uh, the political leaders and to diminish the role of the prophet in this collection. Um, now, 
again, we can argue about that from a historical perspective. It's very difficult to argue from a uh, materialistic aspect, whether um, there is a collection before or not. Maybe there was a prototype. Uh, the short answer is we can't know. But we shouldn't really dismiss the politics happening in these narrations. And if you read them closely and you see how they are constructed, uh, the questions that um, not only Khoui, Khoui and other scholars, also Sunni scholars that they raise, that there are some politics happening in there. And probably there was a collection during the Prophet uh, time, at least a proto-collection. Proto I don't have a strong opinion uh, concerning that. Uh, um so i'm but i do understand both opinions and uh, this makes sense this makes sense and at the end of the day if we get something uh, a manuscript or a fragment uh, we could revisit this issue later on in in a sense thank you you know there are a couple of other questions in the same line but then there are other yes. questions more related to your talk and the sure, so, but sure. because those other questions come first, I read it. But there are three questions I combine them together. So to okay. you see, is there a sufficient sufficient evidence to support the claim that Quran was not compiled during the Prophet time? We kind of add this it. If so, what were the reasons for this? Was it due to lack of resources, time, or illiterate individuals who could write? So this kind of you address it. What evidence supports the claim that Quran and Quran is the same as the one that was originally revealed to the Prophet? So this is a traditional view, you know, and somehow. Uh, this is the, the uh, you know, we can relate it to Isha Karatu, I mean, Isha Tabator or something like that. Was the And then the other question, which I think this is more specific, was the order of the surahs in the Quran established by the Prophet himself or by his followers in the years following his passing? And I add to it, what about the also the order of the ayats, uh, verses in the surahs? Because I think these two are different, you know, so, uh, so if you can, uh, yeah. A little bit more answering yeah. around. So, I mean, we we'll start with the easier one. The last, the last one is that the, the, there is a discussion among Muslim scholars that um, the order of the surahs is uh, whether it's tawqifi, right? Whether it's basically revealed, uh, or whether it was ishtihad by the companions. So there's a discussion on that. If people are interested, they can read the different opinions. And uh, Suyuti, he has a long chapter whether it's tawqifi or ishtihadi, the order of the ayat or surah. Of course, they reached the conclusion that the order of the ayat, uh, the verses, is uh, tawqifi, that this is how the order is, but the surahs might be ishtihadi from the companions. Uh, even though there are scholars that also say that the order of the uh, verses also could be ishtihadi. Um, and we have narratives that if we believe that Ibn Mas'ud and uh, Ali bin Abi Talib and Ubay, they had their own codices, that they have the order of the verses is different. So, for example, uh, Ali bin Abi Talib, it's said in the traditions that he had a, a, a mushaf based on Tartib al nuzul right? So when the verses, which verses were revealed first after the other, which is actually more uh, convenient um, as a faqih because you want to know what abrogated what. Uh, you can't know from the current order of the of the verses. Um, so this question is, yeah, there is this agreement among scholars, whether it's uh, uh, revealed or uh, ishtihad uh, from the companions. Um, the other questions, again, I mean, the first two questions are related to, uh, to, yeah. to the ones that uh, you have mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and uh, I, again, my, I, I tend not to take strong positions on, uh, on these issues because not because of anything, it's just because you have, I, I think we always have to take a step and just read why people argue for certain, when we say, well, the reading of the prophet was this, are we reading something different from what the prophet uh, read? Well, forget about that. Like people are always focusing on additions or omissions or different um, uh, order of the verses. Uh, but if you consider the the bigger question, or what does it mean? What is the definition of the Quran in a sense from a theological perspective? Okay, so when you say, well, the Quran is the word of God, and I'm praying and I'm using, uh, I'm reciting the Quran. What does it mean? So when you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, did God say these words? So what does it mean when we say that the Quran is a revelation? So this this whole issue of the Quran, what does it mean? As, as the word of God, this is a, uh, an issue that took, uh, it's still even ongoing that, you know, Muslim scholars never answered. What really does it mean that the Quran is the speech of God? Like, does God speak in this way or not? Uh, is the uh, the Quran, the kalam al-lafzi, is it the uh, verbatim utterances? 
uh, or is it al-kalam al-nafsi as the Ash'ari say, or is it created as some of the Mu'tazilis and some of the Mu'tazilis Shia has also said. So there's a huge debate concerning the nature of the kalam, the nature of the speech, and what really does it mean. So the short answer is, I mean, even if you are reciting the same chapter, uh, which has the same order and which has the same um, uh, words and voweling as the prophet, you are not reciting it in the same way. Uh, you have a different intonation, you have a different voice, the prophet and the companions, they have different intonations, they have different voices, they have different ways of articulating things. Uh, so even if you focus just on the phonetic side of it, the recitation is different. Uh, uh, when you consider the fact of the Qira'at and when you consider the fact that the, the prophet had a, probably was reciting the Quran in a certain dialect, uh, you will add this evidence up and you say, well, from, if you want, from the, from the utterances perspective, probably you are reciting something different from how the prophet was reciting or the companions. Meaning wise, we can argue forever about uh, the meaning, but more or less the meaning is the same, but does it really matter when you are praying? What matters is how you are delivering the verses, whether they are in agreement with a certain qira'a or not. Uh, discussion of meaning, as you all know, you read uh, books of tafsir and you know that uh, Mufassirun, they disagreed on every, almost on every single verse of the Quran and what they, what it actually means. So now the, I think the question now is to the heart of the topic, uh, where, uh, Amir, Mr. Amir Imami asked, uh, he said, thank you for a brilliant presentation. Could you mention some of the possible causes? that led to the different uh, rivayat from the Qurra. You know, the, because the common understanding, uh, the traditional understanding is that these companions learn it from the prophet orally, they transmit it to the next companion, uh, or tabin orally and orally, and then we orally memorizing it, you shouldn't have the change, you, you know what I mean? And I continue addressing articles. Uh, and this is, there is the issue of tabato, there is a change, and then how then you can have seven or 10 or 14 or 50, and then one solution is uh, saying all seven was recited, look, mixing seven ahru, and say all seven are valid. So if, if, if can you, because this is going to the whole heart of the problem, that uh, first that's issue of tabator, and also what is the mechanism you think? Is it, as you mentioned, your read, uh, interaction of the written, oral, stuff like that. So if you can uh, elaborate on that, any level you want to think. So let's first address oral transmission. When any te any text, Arabic or non-Arabic, if you are transmitting something orally, it must undergo changes. That's a golden rule that you don't ever have any text that was transmitted orally in any culture, Chinese, Japanese, Latin, Greek, uh, Arabic, Hebrew. If you are transmitting something orally, it must undergo changes. This is a, this is a golden rule in oral transmission. If you have a text that doesn't have changes, this is where you start raising questions that most probably it wasn't transmitted orally. You should think in the other way. Anything that is transmitted orally without being fixed in a written text, it undergoes changes. So this is why you, you actually, when you talk about the different qiraat, the different readings, canonical or non-canonical, the fact that you have so many variant readings that agree with the Rasm and actually those that do not agree with the Rasm, it gives you actually confidence that the Quran underwent oral transmission because you have all these different variants. If you pick a poem from the third century Hijri or fourth century, you will never find any single variant in this poem. But if you pick up a poem from pre-Islamic period or early Islamic period, you will find that there are so many variants in this poem because it was actually transmitted orally, right? So when you have, when the text is, when the, when any text is fixed in writing and voweled, etc., this is where you stop having variant readings. The same with the Quran. Why after Ibn Mujahid, varied, variant readings started to diminish? Because writing the codices, they were all voweled, they were all um, uh, uh, exactly dotted. There was no chance for people to disagree in how they were reading, unlike the first 200 years where there was so much space for disagreement among the Qurra concerning how to vowel, uh, to vowel the words. So I would probably invite you to think, it, to think about it from the other way, that if you have something orally transmitted and passed down from one generation to, one, to another, 
actually it's more susceptible to changes than a text which is fixed in writing. It's not the other way. So people, you know, usually have this, I would, I would say maybe, maybe a misconception that if something is transmitted orally, it means that it gives you more confidence that it is verbatim. Oral transmission is not about verbatim transmission. It's about content transmission and variation on the text, which happens in any recited text, religious or non-religious. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, what, uh, okay, uh, there is a brother Mehran. Oh, Mehran, Dr. Divaji. We have a question. You can raise. Yeah, ask it. Please ask it. Uh, Dr. Nasser, thanks so much for the talk. It was great introduction. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how much time we have. I wanted to ask something very specific about uh, the role of grammarians. Dr. Musale, how much time do we have? Uh, you, I mean, have your question. You see, Dr. Nasser's okay, so. time is limiting factor. Yeah, I, I'm a to worry about me. I, 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 it's still early my time. It's you guys. So Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, so the role of, uh, you mentioned the role of grammarians. I Unfortunately, didn't read your book, but uh, you know the grammarians and, and or Nohat had a lot of discussions in the in the history. I was wondering which one you are referring to. Uh, is it probably is not between Kufi and Basri because at least the uh, the Quran that is very famous and is uh, remaining is uh, is Kufi is from a Kufi person uh, and uh, versus the other Quran which is from Kasai that is. That is not dominant and is also Kufi, and uh, mm -hmm. but the, the the dominant the dominant syntax is not Kufi though. Uh, at mm -hmm. least uh, the one that is uh, you also mentioned Alfia that is mentioned part like the Alfia is part of that or is based yeah. on that. So so that's one question and it's related to the second part that is. Uh, so there is this book probably I'm sure, uh, I mean <laughs> many people are familiar with this, uh, it's called Mughni, Mughni, Mughni al uh, Labib and Kutub al Aarib, which uh, mm -hmm. the style is that it discusses, like the grammar is discussed and then it brings the verses and then it mm -hmm. discusses this is the role or not, like it discusses in details. And most of the time, I when I check a verse, it's very, very much compliant and coordinated with Hafs, hafs and Asan. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. From a grammatical perspective, I, I was always thinking that maybe in Egypt, like uh, Al Azhar, uh, 100 years ago, they were also considering the syntax and grammarian aspects, and this was the most uh, compliant with the you know with the dominant uh, Arabic syntax. I, I'm not sure, but that was the uh, that was the correct understanding. So yeah, I think that's 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 the first question. Okay, so um, uh, uh, let's start backwards. So uh, when you are reading Ibn Hisham, uh, Mughni al-Labib, or any other edition, so you we have to be careful that uh, the edition is basically all the verses of the Quran in modern editions, they are printed based on Hafsan Asim. So Ibn Hisham might not be referring to Hafsan Asim. And this is the case even in all the tafsirs. So if, if you check, for example, Tafsir al-Tabari, you see that they printed the Quran based on Hafsan Asim. Okay. The editor, or oh, this is a common practice in most editions, they print the Quran based on Hafsan Asim regardless of the manuscript. And I can, for example, I mean, I can show you here. Let me, uh, I didn't include it in my, uh, in my slides, but um, uh, uh, if you give me a second. Uh, go. I can show okay, you. In fact, what I mean is that if <clears throat> when I compare, when I uh, replace that verse with the other Qur'an, mm -hmm. I do not see the connection or the, you know, the consistency from a grammatical perspective. Uh, uh -huh. I think that Adam uh, is saying, I, I want, yeah, can I, oh, I'm sorry, the brother Mehran yes, says yes. maybe Asim is the best grammatically. And then, so if you want to choose, uh, maybe Asim should have been chosen and maybe was the correct one from the beginning, kind of something like that. Okay, so let me very quickly just address that. So this is an example from uh, Suyuti's Tafsir al-Jalalain, okay? So this is a printed edition. Let's say you are reading this. 
the addition here, this is from the editors, for example. Uh, so what they do here, you see, like, for example, Suyuti, he's saying, right? You see here, the, the Quran here is printed according to Hafsa and Asim, but Suyuti's reading was not Hafsa and Asim. Actually, the uh, Suyuti's reading is Abu Amr. And I, I suspect also Ibn Hisham was reading Ibn, uh, Abu Amr. And then Hafs here, Wafi Qira'a al Asra, for Suyuti, this is actually a variant reading. It's not the original, in a sense. So his reading was Abu Amr, and then he's referring to Hafs as uh, a Qira'a, as a variant reading. Um, so I just wanted to mention this in a case that uh, if you are reading Ibn Hisham or, or modern editions of Sibawai or Al Farra, etc., you have to, to pay attention that the modern editions of the um, uh, of these books, they the voweling is based on Hafsa and Asim, and it's not based on the original manuscript. Now, the second uh, part of the question is whether the syntax agrees with Hafs or not. Most of the, the seven readings, more or less, the syntax of them they are similar, right? The disagreement among the seven readers, they are on, a, on, on, on many words when it comes to case endings, but the difference is, is not in syntax. Like the, the case ending in one word is they disagree where the fa'al is or where the object is. The syntax of the Kufan and Basran grammar, more or less, it's very similar. They have disagreements in, I don't know, 100 plus mas'ala that they that discussed in, in, uh, in grammar, but syntactically, there's really not big difference between uh, the seven qiraat or the ten qiraat or even the non-canonical reading. The qiraat are all the Quran is all the same Arabic syntax, okay. But the disagreement is sometimes when you have a um, uh, an, an ambiguous I can, subject. I can give you an example. Actually, last week I was uh, presenting a tafsir uh, exegesis for the same uh, session. And I noticed Tosabbeho and Yusabbeho both were reported. I, I'm not sure one of them was verse, probably the other one was half men awesome. Uh -huh. And uh, I noticed actually Tosabbeho, which is the 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 half uh, men awesome, is preferred from a grammatical perspective. And this was not my first mm -hmm. time that I noticed that the half men awesome is. <clears throat> Is somehow grammatically more uh, maybe fine or I I I do not know I I was just wondering well, if I, there, yeah. that was a big consideration in in Al Ashar when they were choosing that. Probably, probably. So first, you uh, a quick note, a quick uh, footnote on Asim. Asim and Hafs they are not representative of they are not really the real representative of Kufan reading. The real representative of Kufan reading is Hamza and Al Kisai, right? So in many readings, actually, Asim deviates from the Kufan reading, and then he adopts a reading from the Medina, right, or from from Al Basra. So, um, so just this is a footnote on that. Uh, the second point is whether uh, Hafs or Asim's reading is more in line with the mainstream grammar of um, of Al Basra or Basran and slash Kufan grammarians, and this was something that Al Azhar or even the Ottomans even uh, considered probably that's again one one um, uh, one perspective. Another perspective is Hafs actually is the easiest is the easiest among all the ten readings in terms of its principles. There is really not much when it comes to the rules of Hamzas and Ikhtilas and Taqlil and all this stuff. It's very straightforward. And if the Ottomans are adopted, they want to adopt a Kufan reading. It, they are Hanafis. They have to adopt a Iraqi reading. They're not going to adopt the Medina reading. And Hamza's reading and the Kisa'i's reading, it's just no one adopted it uh, historically. So probably Hafs was you know, an option in terms of really being the easiest and being the more uh, uh, aligned reading with Arabic grammar, as you were saying. So this is definitely uh, a possibility. Yeah. Can I can I come say something in the middle? As I remember you reading your article, I, uh, uh, how these seven were chosen by Ibn Mujahid. He didn't want to do seven. And he would go with five, one from each mm -hmm. city. The other four cities were okay, but Kufa was the problem. Uh, as you said, the dominance, but with the Hamza, he, I, I think he preferred uh, Asim uh, uh, or uh, uh, Kasai, I don't know. I, I think Asim. But because yeah. Hamza was popular, the only way he saw this is all I read from your article. So can you explain on that why he have to choose trees from Kufa? Maybe answer this point. Yeah, I mean, in one sense, I'm saying the Mujahid himself thinking Asam is better. Uh, yeah, let you explain. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, but pro probably I get the the issue is awesome. Uh, he he combined elements from the Kufan tradition and from the non Kufan tradition, so probably it was a good choice. And if I remember correctly, I mean, Asim was not early. Asim was not as popular as Hamza in yeah. Kufa. Uh, it, he was popular among people who preferred some kind of traditional recitation, which was Asim. Um, Hamza, he it's either love him or hate him. Many people disliked Hamza and even considered his reading to be bid'ah and innovation, and it's haram to even pray behind him. And other people uh, uh, venerated Hamza. Um, so uh, the Ku Kufa was very problematic to choose. I mean, there's even Al-Kisai, the choice of Al-Kisai is very unusual because more or less he follows Hamza, um, and uh, except in, in certain places. And there are uh, narrations that Ibn Mujahid wanted to choose Yaqub from Basra, uh -huh. but then he dropped him and he put Al-Kisai instead. And uh, there's a very interesting, again, role of politics. There's an interesting um, uh, quotation from Ibn al-Arabi, not the Sufi, the, uh, the judge, uh, in his book. And he says, uh, means that al-Kisai was entered because al-Kisai was connected with the caliphs, right? With al-Ma'moon, and he was the mu'addib, the tutor for, uh, for al-Ma'moon's uh, children. Uh, Ibn al-Arabi said that the only reason Al-Kisai became part of Ibn Mujahid's system is that due to his connections, um, uh, that he was politically probably uh, influential. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, there are considerations to be considered here. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Selene Ibrahim, could you uh, op uh, open the microphone and ask your question? Uh, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating, uh, Dr. Nasser. I'm I'm wondering as I'm doing presentations for non-Muslim audiences and the like, what would be a good example of a difference in Qiraat that actually affects meaning? Just to give a to give a sense to people who, you know, we still we still I suppose want want to preserve the sense that the the shades of meaning are often subtle and not super drastic but i'm wondering if it what would be the most drastic difference that you've come across with with the different qiraat that could make a good example as we sort of explain this process particularly to i mean even to a muslim audience but just at a more basic level i mean i i wouldn't i i don't think there are drastic uh Okay, for, before, before drastic, one, even if we consider one qira'a, you went, I'm sure you read a lot of tafsir, and even, even if you only consider one qira'a, you would know that exegetes would have different opinions on the interpretation of the verse, even if it's read in only one qira'a. Mm -hmm. And, right, so even if we go with the with sifat, with the sifat and with the kalam and with the arsh, which has only all, they all have one meanings. And you know that exegetes would have completely drastic different interpretations of what these things mean, even if they are read in one meaning, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so that's one point. The second point is I, I don't think there are readings that have really drastic changes, including non-canonical readings in the way that, oh, well, this mean this meaning is completely 180 degrees different from the other meaning. There are certain readings, I think, 50 plus that they have slight legal um, uh, implications. For example, the the uh, the Qarna versus Qirna fi fi right? Mm. So there is uh, uh, they say uh, Qirna comes from al Waqar, from being uh, um, a prudent. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to stay at home. Qarna com comes from the verb waqara, to basically stay at home. And there is a legal uh, uh, subtlety here is whether the wives of the Prophet had to stay home according to the Qarna reading versus they don't have to stay home in the Qarna reading, for mm -hmm. example, right? Um, example. The other reading, of course, the wudu, the ablution, right? Um, uh, this is the famous disagreement among uh, scholars, whether you have to wipe the feet or whether you have to wash the feet, arjulikum wujuhikum wujuhakum, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not actually a Shi'i Sunni thing. It's a Sunni thing among the different uh, readings because Abu Amr has a reading and the uh, other uh, readers have it in the uh, Mansub or in the Majroor. Do you wipe the feet based on the syntax or do you uh, wash them? So this is a legal uh, issue. 
uh, theological issues are very, very um, uh, subtle, like Maliki Yawm al-Din and Maliki Yawm al-Din. Many people uh, and theologians would say, well, is God the owner of the day of judgment or is he the king of the day of judgment? And they go into a theological debate uh, whether king makes more sense than owner. Mm -hmm. um, so these changes are, are uh, very uh, uh, like subtle and small. I wouldn't really call them drastic, um, that they would really change anything fundamental in, in a sense, even, even non-canonical readings in, in that regard. Thank you. That that was very helpful. And just as a quick follow up, what's the most shocking thing that maybe you've you've seen that surprised you the most as you were going going through this, you know, the the whole process? Of I mean, the shocking. To be honest, the most uh, shocking thing is would be if you compare the attitude of modern Muslim scholars to the to the uh, attitude of early Muslim scholars, and how early scholars were very relaxed about the whole issue of variants. Uh, that's, I would call it shocking. It's not shocking that you have variants in a text. It's just the shocking is that how, um, if, if you want orthodoxy progresses over time, and then it's like, oh, we are only following these seven readings and only these 10 readings, and we are rejecting everything else. And you see that the uh, early Muslim scholars were very relaxed about that. It's just a text and you can read it this way. You can read it that way. Uh, including Ibn al-Arabi himself, he was, even though he was uh, severe in some of his judgment, would say, okay, in one recitation, I would read according to Qalun, and another recitation, I would read according to, to Asim. So I would say shocking in a sense of, um, uh, in, a, in a good sense, is that it's great that the early scholars have this kind of really uh, uh, relaxed and um, uh, 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 position, if you want, concerning diversity of, of, of opinions, accepting this uh, uh, reading, accepting that reading. Some of them, of course, they were very vehement about rejecting certain readings, but the, just the position, I think, early Muslims and modern Muslims is just very different, at least the way I see it. Thank you so much. That's a great piece of uh, wisdom to take forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, regarding this relax or uh, behavior, so what about the, uh, because I asked the, the question, which is the tabator, because uh, in the common uh, people, folk in the street, they believe this uh, all seven or 10 of them are, are from the prophet and not only are from prophet, there is a chain which reached tabator. As I understand mm -hmm. your book and also Ayatollah Khoi uh, says, None of them in Tabata. Even the Shia circles, look, uh, I'm, I'm honest, uh, maybe half uh, awesome, it wasn't necessarily she, she, but recently they say because he was in Kufa, maybe some connection, as you show it in one of the slides, they say that he learned it from uh, uh, when the chain goes up, reaches Osman ibn Affan and Ali ibn uh, Abi Talib. So in this way, they want to say, okay, Gharat, uh, uh, have says uh, awesome is more she, you know what I mean? Uh, but there is any meaningful be like that, maybe because she may be more reasonable to be Medina or something like that, because imams were there. Uh, so I'm saying, can you, uh, because this is the controversial one, can you, uh, let, let's, I know your books there, chains are there, you show to that. Let's address this issue and then see the truth. I mean, how, how the thing is, how you judge it, whether these chains are reached about or what the situation they have, or how is it the case? Okay. First, uh, on uh, Hui's position on Tawatur, yes, as you said, he, he and um, I think most Shia scholars, they don't consider the Qira'at to be Mutawatira. And I think it's very clear in his, uh, not in his uh, introduction to the Tafsir, in Urwufqa, in Bab al-Salat, he has a section, I can, I can send it to people if they are interested, and he clearly states the position of Shias. He said that the only reason we read Hafs an Asim is that because the majority of Muslims read Hafs an Asim. There's no such thing as, it, it, maybe it goes to Ali, maybe it doesn't go to Ali. That's not the reason why they read Hafsan Asim. Uh, Shi'is, uh, they read Abu Amr ibn al-Ala for hundreds of years before the Ottoman period. And he stated clearly, we don't prefer one reading over the other. And now, um, um, and he very clearly, he said, now we read it, we read on Hafs according to the majority of Muslims, but there's no preference which reading we choose. So that's one. Second, concerning Tawatur, it's not only Shi'i scholars as al Khu'i concerning the Tawatur. The discussion of Tawatur is, is old, even within uh, Sunni scholarship. Um, you, before even the whole concept of Tawatur uh, took place, there, were, there was discussion whether the Qira'at are Mutawatira or not. So it's not something that the, uh, the other side, if you want, uh, picked up. 
And the, the issue is tawatur is a very concept that it's a concept that has to do with usul al-fiqh, okay? What happened is that when you take a concept from one discipline and then you apply it to another discipline, this is where the, uh, uh, if you want, discrep discrepancy takes place. Tawatur has nothing to do with chains of transmission. Like the, the, if you want chains of transmission and tawatur, they are oil and water, okay? Meaning what? When tawatur means that there is a concept or there's something that everyone is familiar with and everyone knows, okay? Uh, it reaches a stage where even you and I, we are from different backgrounds and we live in different places that we agree on this certain topic or certain piece of information. And it can't be false because we have, you and I, we have no reason to fabricate or create error, okay? In delivering this piece of information. And the typical example is, we say, oh, China is a country that exists, or New York exists in America, or uh, the sun rises from the east. This is Tawatur, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter if you are uh, Iranian or American or, or Egyptian, everyone knows that China exists. So that's a Mutawatur uh, information. So what happened is that originally Tawatur was a concept that is used in epist epistemology. Okay, we want to differentiate what tawatur is from akhbar al-ahad, from, uh, from, 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 from other uh, uh, levels of akhbar. And then usulis took that and then they applied it to qiraat later on. And what happened is that you can't have chains of transmission and tawatur at the same time. And that's what Shi'i scholars, uh, including al khui picked up later on is that what does it mean that something is mutawatir, but you have chains of transmission? So this is why Shi'is dropped chains of transmission whatsoever. And they said, well, Quran is mutawatir. We don't need chains of transmission in, in a sense. Um, so if you have something that is transmitted through 30 people or 40 people or even 50 people, that doesn't mean it's mutawatir. And the reason why is that only people in a very small local uh, enclosed space, they are familiar with the reading of Abu Amr or, or, uh, or Asim. And the perfect example is now, even today in North Africa, they're only familiar with one reading, but they are not familiar with the other readings. So how could the Qira'at be mutawatira and known to every single Muslim if one region is only familiar with its own reading? And if you go back to in time, you will find that even in one region, there were different readings circulating among Muslims. And that's the point I was trying to flesh out in the book based on, again, Muslim opinions and Muslim sources is that there's debate among scholars. And the reason why we want to make Qira'at Mutawatira, it's a, it's, it's a more or less an issue of usul al-fiqh. You want to establish the Quran and Qira'at as the supreme source of law because it abrogates everything and you can't make hadith abrogated. If the Quran is transmitted versus chains of transmissions, it stays on the same level as hadith, which doesn't work. It's mostly really um, a matter of usul al-fiqh rather than really a, uh, a matter whether the Quran was really transmitted by Tawatur or not. Uh, so that's the, uh, the issue here is that the Quran, according to usulis, it is transmitted by Tawatur, at least the text of it, the rasm, and it's known to all Muslims. How to pronounce it and how to articulate its letters, that's debatable. Later Muslims, uh, now you find it like the common, if you want the mainstream opinion is that the Quran is mutawatir and even in some masahif, they would write it al-mushaf bil qira al-mutawatir and every single person now when you say al-qira'at al-sab'a al-mutawatir and every single modern scholarship in Arabic, you'll find al-qira'at al-mutawatir, al-qira'at al-mutawatir. It's like became something like, something that you need to, to believe in rather than really something that you prove. Um, so that's that's the that's the issue. It's just mainly it's a concept that was taken from one discipline and applied to uh, to another discipline that created this kind of discrepancy uh, in the in the concept. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know if any other people have any questions uh, or those uh, friends because yeah, I enjoy we talking. I mean, this is the best thing you can do in Ramadan: a Quranic discussion, kind of. Uh, they say one hour thinking about God, so maybe better than 70 years of Ibadah. 
So this is really I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how spiritual the uh, the talk was, but uh, no, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> no, enlightening is very good uh, and informative, enlightening and, and interesting. We really enjoyed it. I I let uh, because it's still two hours. I think Brother Musalla was also. He has to keep me always. Uh, tell me, look, let's take it on time. So I think if anybody has a question, can raise their hand and ask it or send it to me. If not, I let uh, uh, Dr. Musalla maybe. Uh, First, we thanking you. Very, very enjoyed it to come here from your time. Busy schedule is very informative for us. Uh, we all yeah, know, Dr. Nasser, you, you were on leave. And uh, honestly, when I contacted him, uh, he accepted quickly. And I'm very pleased. And uh, we're actually very happy that we had you here. It, it was a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I'm sure uh, no, my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's uh, it's good to uh, increase uh, awareness, uh, especially in in these in these settings. So it's good to uh, uh, to do that. And I'm very pleased that. Uh, yeah, that's this is uh, our goal. Done. This is, thank, this is why you. we invited yeah. you. We just want to hear opinions and then discuss them. I'm not sure if there is any other question. I have a short question, Dr. Nasser, sorry. Uh, among these variants, uh, have you also seen people discussing the wax that uh, emerged like centuries after the first uh, Mosafs? Uh, you mean wax uh, posing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, you you know the wakuf, the way that the posing uh, it's it's usually a, like a modern phenomena that you have some early like in the early early manuscripts you will not find uh, right no, any uh, I know. any sign yeah but, verse separators only yeah but like the 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 timeline you were showing it was all the way to eight centuries so right. uh, some of the vaps uh, uh, punctuation marks and stuff actually emerged before that. So I was just wondering how that potentially played a role. Uh, yeah, maybe so, not. Uh, no, I mean, that's an interesting uh, point. I never thought of in including um, uh, the signs of what and where to pause, where you are prohib prohibited to pause uh, in that. I, I mean, it's an interesting uh, perspective like to, to, to think of what and again, uh, if you remember from the from the second or third slide I showed you, like the waqf in uh, uh, the rules of waqf, at least th there are common rules of waqf, but there are wukuf in um, in the maghribi recitation that are different from the wukuf in the mashriqi recitation. So, and if you also read, uh, of course, works of tafsir, you will find that sometimes the exegetes will say, "Well, you can't pause here because the meaning will change." But that's an interesting perspective to think of the signs in, in the wukuf and uh, how they were maybe fleshed out to add it into this kind of, of scheme. So uh, thank you. I will I will rethink about that in, in terms of, of wukuf. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Great talk. So, Thanks for that. Dr. Odusi, any other question you see or... No, we are, we are very, uh, thank you very much for Dr. Nasser and also the participant, the good questions. We are looking forward, inshallah, uh, maybe in the near future, you have Dr. Nasser uh, joining us again, maybe about the website, other stuff. Uh, and then, I, I, for example, are you going to add this, uh, 50, you said 50, uh, 50 of these have implication for the law. Are you going to add them to, for example, to the website too, that I search what are the vera differences have? Yeah, implication actually the they are already there so if oh, i may show great. you let me let me show you and you. you can how how you do it um so if you uh here so if you go to uh variants right here right uh to yes. annotation okay you go to annotations you go to the filter and i took them from a book called al uh, ikhtilaf al ahkam right okay so you click on al ahkam you save it here and they are there, basically almost uh -huh. 30 something. And I have a footnote here. For example, here, Waqarna, this is the first uh -huh. one. It's as I can, the prophet's wives leave their houses without an urgent excuse. So this is a matter, a legal matter that uh, scholars discussed. Um, uh, Liturbu versus Liarbu. Again, this is a legal uh, issue here. 
about the interest prohibition absolute or only when the intent of the uh, one giving interest is clear tahrim al riba lada qasd al murabi so i have them there i collected them so you are welcome to uh, and the page number of the book is there but you can also check the the uh, the first in the tafsir and then you can check the legal differences among uh, among readers there yeah Oh, thank you. This is very interesting. And maybe I've come to implications because even the Hadith, the, 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 we have issues that contemporary role of women in society. I don't want to open the topic. There are Hadiths also implicating that it's better the women stay at home. But now modern Muslim uh, female, uh, uh, dispute, I mean, many scholars disputing this Hadith yeah. from Shia tradition. From Shia tradition. Yeah. So, so, so this, this is very interesting, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very and much. This one, I was just, I, I did that uh, recently. For example, La Mastum versus La Mastum and Nisa. There's even a legal discussion um, whether uh, what invalidates ablution, the wudu, is it only touching physically the woman or having intercourse? So there's even a legal discussion in that. And it gives you also an, you know, probably. Uh, uh, an idea that many of these variant readings are Burton suggested that many of the variant readings emerged due to legal disputes. Exactly. Uh, in, this, in this case. So, yeah, thank, thank you. And oh, this is, uh, sorry, this is the ablution, the wudu um, that uh, uh, Celine asked me, warjulakum versus warjulikum. Uh, the wiping or the washing, also the discussion is there. So I, I collected them in here. You can check them under, uh, under this label. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, all wonderful, all wonderful. Thank you so much again, Dr. Nasser, for joining us. And as Dr. Qadusi said, uh, uh, this is about the first time we had you. So we look forward to uh, more discussion on other topics, inshallah, as your time allows and as we can, as we can manage that. Uh, thank you so much thank again. You. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. And uh, Ramadan Kareem and uh, Eid Mubarak Qariban. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in person uh, uh, next fall when I come back. Yeah. That was my point. You're at Harvard next to us. So hopefully we yes. can see each other in person. Uh, thanks everybody for joining the program. This is a, a three nights lecture. Tomorrow we have the Jawad Hashmi and then his presentation is on Muhammad and the submitters and Jews and Christians were Muslims. So we'll see you all inshallah tomorrow and uh, we'll let you guys go. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye bye.